Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Welcome to this press conference. My name is uh, Machel Bus, Mac for short. I am director at Mainline Foundation in the Netherlands, and I have the honor to uh, chair this uh, press conference today. Um, uh, this press conference intends to address some of the key issues and new science uh, that is, uh, you know, in, in the harm reduction field, uh, relevant in the harm reduction field now. Um, and today the topic is uh, drug testing, which is a much contested uh, topic within the harm reduction field. Um, this uh, press conference is being live streamed, so uh, welcome to all those uh, that are uh, watching from, the, uh, from their couch at home. Um, before I introduce all my colleagues here, um, I would just like to address very briefly that drug testing uh, has been uh, yeah, a, a part of the, of the uh, heavy debate in some of the countries uh, where our presenters are from uh, in the last uh, year. Uh, for example, the UK and Australia, there's been a lot of debates, public debates about drug testing, and it's actually led to uh, government-sanctioned pill testing in those countries, which I think is really good. Um, the debate really centers around uh, the testing of ecstasy pills in the party setting a lot. Uh, I feel that uh, the discussion should also be about expanding that to uh, testing other type of substances, for example, heroin, uh, uh, which is a, of course a, a very um, dangerous drug of being uh, contaminated with other stronger substances like fentanyl, and drug testing can really play a role in reducing those risks. So in terms of harm reduction, I think it's important not to only fo uh, focus on ecstasy testing, but also on other uh, drugs. Um, let me start with uh, a few uh, small, remind, uh, small housekeeping announcements. Um, we will hear uh, a few brief remarks from all the presenters. Uh, they only have five minutes each, so they have to be very, very quick. Um, and uh, after they all finish their speeches or their presentations, there's room for questions from all the journalists here in the room. Um, and uh, after the press conference, there's room to address all the speakers one-on-one, -on -one, uh, arrange an interview if you like, and go into more depth about uh, their work and uh, their presentations. So, without further ado, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll introduce our first speaker, which is my colleague from the Netherlands, Daan van der Gouwe. Uh, he's a researcher at uh, DIMS, the Drug Information and Monitoring System in the Netherlands, uh, centered in uh, Trimbos uh, Institute. Um, and he has a, a lot of experience in the drug testing field. So, Daan, you can have the floor. Thank you, Machtelt. Um, I am representing the oldest drug uh, checking service in the world, uh, DIMS, Drugs Information Monitoring System. Uh, we started off as an unofficial service back in 87 already of the last century. We formalized in 1992 and uh, ever since 1999 we have been subsidized by the Ministry of Health at the national level and also um, by local authorities. We have 31 testing locations throughout the country and we are mainly testing recreational drugs, so ecstasy, amphetamines, also new drugs. And um, in the afternoon I will speak more about uh, how we do this work. Um, now I would like to focus for a few uh, minutes on the lessons learned in all those years of drug checking uh, uh, in our country. Um, the first lesson that we have learned is that it's very essential to build trust, uh, trust uh, initially uh, from drug users, because without users you will have no service and you have no data. But equally important is also to build trust with uh, politicians, because at the national level they are the ones who, who will decide about you know, uh, whether or not to continue your work and whether or not to subsidize your work. Uh, equally important is local communities, uh, local authorities, um, and also working with the media is very essential because in case of warning for extra uh, dangerous drugs, you need to have the support of uh, media and you need to have the understanding of media as well. They have to know exactly what you're doing and why you're doing the things that you're doing. Uh, another lesson learned is uh, uh, that you have to give reliable information and if you don't have reliable information, don't give anything at all. Reliable, it means that you know, when you issue a warning uh, on a specific tablet, 
uh, it has to be as specific as possible, uh, as concise as possible, not just warning for drugs in general because nobody will listen, especially drug users, they will not listen. But if you warn for a specific tablet, for instance, a pink Superman containing no MDMA but only PMMA, it makes sense and you will have full coverage and the full cooperation also of the media. We have done this several times and uh, it has proven to be very effective. Uh, and um, uh, so this is very important as well. Um, another main thing uh, is that um, uh, don't sit on your data as a, as a drug service. Don't keep it to yourself, but share it as widely as possible. This is why we use uh, uh, social media uh, and other uh, channels as well to uh, spread the word when uh, something contagious is on the market. Um, to finalize my, my short talk is that drug checking is not about saving lives. It's basically about minimization of, of harms, but you could never exclude uh, people dying from uh, even a tested ecstasy tablet because it could happen to anyone. But at least it contributes to a, a safer world. And uh, we believe strongly that by doing our work, uh, the, the many years that we do it really has uh, reduced uh, drug-related incidents. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Um, I'll introduce the next speaker, which, who is uh, Julian Quintero. I hope I pronounced it right. I practiced. Uh, he is director of uh, Acción Técnica Social in Colombia. Uh, and Julian will give some insight into some of the interesting work that's being done at the festivals, the music festivals in his country. Go ahead. Hi. <clears throat> Good morning. Um, my name is Julian Quintero. I'm from Bogota. I know I speak English, please, for my pronunciation, sorry. I read for the little past the information for the afternoon is, is long, the presentation. Uh, okay, drug checking in Colombia, uh, reduction in drug poisoning in Bogota and drug checking service. Okay, the data. Uh, we have analyzed more than 60,000 drug samples since February 2030. Drugs give voluntary big consumer because they seek healthcare. Uh, we have been to more than 119 festivals in 10 years, serving more than 78,000 people directly, impacting more than 430,000 people per year. We have published 48 early warnings, more than 30 million people have seen or heard and read use lasted twists in the last 10 years due to more 200 press releases they have been published in formal media. The Drug Observatory of Colombia has discovered 52 NPS in Colombia in the last 10 years. 12 in deaths new drugs have been provided by us. Just a month ago, go, just a month ago, ago, for example, 87,000 people saw our message of harm reduction of the screen of the most important music festival in Colombia. That is how this every year for five years. The Stereo Picnic is a one of the festival with less intoxication and without mortality in South America. We are one of the few organizations in Colombia which focus on the reduction of drug intoxication and the, its admissions to the emergency service of hospitals. The other program seeks prevention and abandonment of consumption. Some evaluation data to user people in my program. 96% confidence in the people who care in our tent. 89% consider that the project information has been useful to change their consumption habits. 83% say they have not used the substance when the result was negative. 70-70% have reduced the mixtures and drugs. 85 begins with the low dose. 95% worry about ignoring the quality of the substance. 86% look for the early warning information. 82% tell to your friends about the harm reduction. 
the data, psychedelics, for example, in 2016, 2,052 cases in Bogota. In 2018, 1,024 cases in Bogota. In cocaine, and 23 years, uh, 20, 30 years, and 35 cases, and 28 years, 24 cases. In ATS, ecstasy, and MDMA, uh, for example, in 22, uh, okay, sorry, five, 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 four case in 20,000, and uh, in 2018, 32 case. And uh, mixes drugs, for example, in 2030, 200 case, and 2018, 136 case. Yes, it's no more. Okay, and the STAR project in the 2010, the STAR drug checking in 2030, and the final support major of Bogota 2050 and the 2060, the NPS arrived Colombia in Catinons, for example. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. Very interesting to hear an example from Colombia. Uh, the next speakers are uh, doing a joint uh, uh, <laughs> presentation. Um, they are Lorin Collar and Jeffrey Fell. Lorin is um, a senior project manager at the Federation Addiction in France. Um, and she will reflect on the French experience of drug checking. And Jeffrey Fell from Médecins du Monde will make some brief comments from his perspective. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm uh, from Federation Addiction. It's a national professional network in France. It's, uh, we are based in Paris. Um, so um, we're here together with uh, Gregory to uh, talk to you about uh, the, the challenge of scaling up drug, uh, drug checking services in France and uh, the link uh, that we promote with the health monitoring systems, uh, both in France and at European level. So, uh, first things that you have to know uh, is that uh, during decades, uh, checking illicit drugs in France was not recognized as a health uh, and arm reduction uh, measure. Um, all, uh, all organizations that were uh, promoting arm reduction struggled with the law, uh, of course, in France, as in uh, lots of countries in the world. Uh, but organizations such as uh, Doctors of the World uh, has been experiencing uh, drug checking services in nightlife settings and in uh, using uh, contacts. And uh, in the meantime, health agencies uh, developed monitoring systems to uh, check and uh, monitor what was on the market uh, in the early 2000s. Well, the beginning of the early 2000s. So those two um, um, systems uh, grew together, and uh, now, uh, since 2016, we had a change in legislation, and we had a change in what is recognized as health uh, and arm reduction missions and measures to be provided by service providers as well as community-based organizations. And uh, drug checking, illicit drug checking, uh, has been recognized by the law. So now we are facing a challenge of scaling up what has been uh, experimenting um, by uh, certain organizations to have uh, a very strong network system of drug checking um, between uh, organizations who would collect because they are um, acting uh, in settings where uh, drug use is uh, active and uh, other organizations who have labs, on-site labs or mobile labs to, um, to allow to have a very quick qualitative uh, and quantitative approach of uh, drug checking. So this is the challenge that we're facing. Uh, this uh, scaling up process is done with the support of networks such as Federation Addiction and uh, in a very strong relation with uh, Health Monitoring Agency, the French Monitoring Center for Drug and Drug Addictions, um, which is also developing a um, monitoring system to, um, to be able to tell what are the trends of the black market uh, in France. Um, so the challenge uh, is um, uh, starting to um, 
to be effective and now we have 50 services involved uh, in this process and uh, we have a strong link with the French monitoring system um, in a health perspective to share the data and the database uh, as every opportunity allows. So now I'm going to give the floor to Gregory to speak about the, the, his perspective on that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Lauren. Um, I'm going to add just uh, a few things because you, pr you presented quite well, I guess, <laughs> um, the rest of, of the, um, the program. Um, I, I represent here um, the XBT program from Doctors of the World, um, which supports uh, access to drug checking as a harm reduction tool uh, since 1999, and we support uh, empowerment of people and defend a wide access to health programs and uh, we, um, we defend that the fact that health programs for drug users include uh, a drug checking service. We know that uh, people who use drugs are really concerned by the content of the, the drugs they buy and we identify it as a um, positive behavior for their health and um, we also identified that uh, uh, because of the prohibition, the contents of the drugs are uh, exactly unknown, so we have to, to face it, um, to, to face this problem also in France. And we ask now uh, the government to support our network, which is uh, complementary to health monitoring system, but it's, it's not yet re well recognized and uh, we don't have yet a full support of our government. So that's that what we ask today. Thank you. Uh, next speaker is uh, Slava Kuzhakov from Ukraine. Um, he is senior advisor with the Alliance for Public Health in Ukraine. And um, they've recently undertaken quite some interesting moves in the party scene in Ukraine. You have the floor. Uh, uh, I'm from Ukraine and we are uh, several years behind. That's why we don't have much uh, scientific findings to present, but I will tell you about the program. Uh, in April uh, 2018, the Alliance for Public Health in Ukraine, with support from Elton John AIDS Foundation, uh, launched the uh, online counseling services and the nightlife safety program uh, for experimenting young people. For us, it's a new area in the development of harm reduction, uh, which will address uh, uh, experimental and recreational drug use and also build more uh, conscious relationship uh, with psychoactive substances. Uh, there is a real likelihood of transition from experimental or recreational drug use uh, to problem use, to dependency, uh, severe disorders, criminal engagement, HIV, uh, late detection of HIV and late start of treatment. Uh, the causes of these tran transitions are not uh, necessarily uh, linked to the substances themselves, uh, but uh, they are linked to the lack of objective information, uh, lack of conscious attitude to the consumption of substances uh, that is caused by taboos and stigma, uh, criminalization and punitive policies. We have now unique opportunities for early detection of potential problems, uh, which is only possible in the context of trust and open conversation, anonymity, and protection against judgment and oppression. Uh, the services we offer are based on the concept of smart pleasure, and they cover a range of themes of interest to young people while also introducing uh, health-related subjects such as safer substance use, harm reduction, sexual and reproductive health, uh, promotion and early detection and treatment of HIV and viral hepatitis, mental health, and also uh, safeguards from violence and human rights violations. Uh, we work online and we work at music, uh, music events, music festivals. Uh, there is the online resource which uh, is called Drugstore Org UA and it offers online counseling, uh, risk screening and referrals, informative blog, frequently asked questions, as 
associated social media channels and the mobile application Free to Ask, which is designed to facilitate access to online counseling. Uh, in one year, uh, the resource uh, was visited by 50,000 people, uh, 2,000 took the screening test, and more than 1,000 people also tested for HIV and other infections. Uh, as far as the festivals are concerned, so far we worked in about seven events, in seven events uh, in the capital of Ukraine. Uh, but more importantly, in August 2018, we launched the first uh, drug checking service uh, in Ukraine. Uh, we are using rapid colorimetric tests. Uh, and we use them so far during the Brave Factory Festival and the Rhythm Bureau Festival. Uh, these are large electronic music festivals in Kiev. Uh, we distributed 430 tests, and people use this test at their convenience. Uh, people have met this service with great enthusiasm and appreciation, and uh, they considered it to be a miracle similar to the miracle of needle and syringe programs that people faced 25 years ago in Ukraine. Uh, so many of the people actually agreed to tell us about the results, and we received pictures of the process, and we received the actual uh, information on the test. So we started collecting the data that will enable us to uh, uh, address the policy changes that are required. Uh, currently, we are also field testing immunoassay tests. Uh, we are also working with lawyers who advise us on a relatively safe degree of experimentation that we can allow ourselves uh, with the drug checking uh, in the current legal environment. Uh, we are also preparing proposals and will push for legislative changes required to enable receiving samples from clients uh, in order to be able to use more reliable methods of uh, analysis uh, as the ones that the colleagues are using in other countries. Uh, so we plan to collect more data uh, to inform policy work. Uh, we negotiate the introduction of Nightmare as well, uh, who would offer us extra protection of the stigma-free and violence-free territory, both online and at the youth events. Uh, today at music festivals, the only type of violence that people experience is violence from law enforcement, from people who are actually supposed to protect us from the violence. So the drug uh, checking service is still a semi-underground program. Uh, law enforcement remains skeptical and they propose alternative ways to approach the issue of recreational drug use. For example, to uh, check urine in schools or teach parents how to use this kind of type of testing. Uh, so the, the, the exact method that actually uh, failed many years ago and will only lead to stigma, will only lead to oppression and violence. Uh, so. Uh, Essentially, uh, checking of psychoactive substances should not be controversial. It is designed to protect people who do not have dependency, substance use disorders, or other significant problems unless they are inadequately treated by law enforcement and, and, and conservative radical communities. One in nine people who use drugs will never develop problem use or severe disorders provided that they have access to objective information on substances, uh, their classifications, associated effects and risks, interactions and precautions to take in order to avoid them, provided that they do not get prosecuted for getting and possessing substances that are unlikely to harm them, provided that they do not face stigma and ostracism from families and communities. And thank you very much. Uh, I encourage you to attend the session on drug checking at three, where we will give a little bit more detail and also provide some pictures. Thank you very much. <coughs> thank you, Slava. And our final speaker is uh, Mr. Jeff Bartwell from Canada. He is a postdoctoral research fellow at the BC Center on Substance Use and the Faculty of Medicine at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. Uh, and Jeff will give us a brief overview of the, pers um, the new technologies that are available in drug testing. OK, oh, great. Jeff. Thank you. Uh, so as we've heard on this panel, drug checking has been offered in various settings for people who use drugs recreationally, but how it may reduce harms for those who use drugs frequently, particularly people who inject drugs, people who are living in poverty, is less known. So drug checking was recently introduced in the province of British Columbia, where Vancouver is in Canada, as a harm reduction intervention in response to our overdose crisis that we're currently experiencing, which is largely driven by fentanyl adulterated drugs. Uh, so for example, last year, fentanyl was detected in more than 80% of our overdose deaths. 
so early implementation of drug checking services was targeted in the inner city primarily for people who inject drugs and those that are living in poverty. Um, however, a low percentage of people actually use these services and when they were first rolled out, only 1% of clients were using them. So we interviewed people who inject drugs in Vancouver to try to get an understanding of what their perspectives are on drug checking and what might be some barriers preventing them from accessing these services. So I'm gonna talk briefly about um, four of our findings. Um, so we found that there's several social and structural barriers as well as technological barriers that are preventing people who use drugs and those experiencing poverty from accessing these services. So the first one I would like to talk about is time dedication. And so this is uh, really, uh, people saw time as a barrier. So this is the t either the time waiting in line to use a service or the t time required to wait to have uh, the results reported to you. And so particularly when we're thinking about people who are going through uh, withdrawal symptoms or dope sickness, um, people needed to consume their drugs immediately. And so the idea of waiting was not, was seen as a barrier. Um, so secondly, uh, people talked about about the sophistication of results. So there's a variety of different technologies. Um, and so some technologies can provide results more quickly, uh, but we learned that people uh, were less interested in ones that said uh, either a positive or negative result for fentanyl, and they were more interested in a percentage breakdown. Um, Additionally, there are some technologies that don't provide a low concentration. They're unable to measure low concentrations of some substances. And so, for example, if you think of someone who's using a stimulant such as cocaine and there's a low um, amount of an opioid in it, th that may be of greater concern for them. And so if, it, if that technology is unable to detect low concentrations, that's an issue. Um, third uh, barrier <clears throat> was providing a sample. So the idea of no matter how small of amount of drug you need to provide, when you're living in poverty and you do not have enough money to buy your drugs and you're hustling and you're working hard every day to get the drugs that you need, uh, the idea of giving up even a little amount of your drugs was uh, discussed as a barrier. And then lastly, a lot of people that we interviewed talked about their drug dealers and how they trust their drug dealers. They might have longer relationships, they might be getting a consistent supply, so they saw drug checking as futile um, because they had more trust in their dealers. So in conclusion, um, our findings suggest that there's a lot of barriers that are largely driven by poverty and criminalization for people accessing drug checking, particularly those living in poverty and those who are injecting drugs daily. Um, but there are some areas for improvement and opportunities that we found. So one would be technological improvements. Uh, so if we can focus on technologies that can provide uh, greater detail, so the percentage of what are the contents of the drugs, this may increase the um, benefits and uh, the uptake of these services. Um, and additionally, having these come out in a timely fashion rather than waiting half an hour or 15 minutes or, or whatnot because time was a barrier. And secondly is working with drug dealers. Um, so a lot of harm reduction interventions really target people who are using drugs. And so, uh, you know, if drug checking programs can actually engage with drug dealers, you're moving drug checking up the supply chain. So uh, drug dealers can provide information about the drugs that they're selling to their customers. And so this will allow people who use drugs to make more informed choices about what drugs they're buying and how they're going to use them. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so. Uh those were all our speakers, very interesting. I think uh, we've all seen now based on their uh, experiences that there's quite a demand for this service, that it can potentially also extend to other types of drugs than just party drugs. Um, and that, that, that there's a huge potential to reduce harms um, because of alter, adulteration of drugs, um, but that it can also lead to behavior change, for example, in terms of taking less, being more responsible with what you take. Um, we are very happy to take your questions. Um, if you go up, uh, we don't have a mic in the room, so you, uh, please stand up, state your name, state uh, the media outlet that you're working for, um, and who you direct the question to, and I'll repeat your question in the mic. Um, I see a question there in the room. Go ahead. Uh, 
the question is about the conflicts with law enforcement that you might encounter in the field. I didn't uh, get your name and uh, the media outlets. From Ukraine, Elena. Uh, it's a question to all speakers. So what are your experiences with law enforcement? Maybe I can just start. Um, what I try to mention in my short talk is that it's essential to have, uh, uh, to have understanding from law enforcement. If you don't have it, it will uh, really make your work very difficult to do. Uh, we managed to have a relationship with law enforcement, with police at a local and a national level in order to do the work that we do. Firstly, because we work with illicit drugs, you know, so you need to have a regulation that allows you to work with these drugs. But even more important, it's that users of drugs, they feel safe and content to actually visit your service because they, if whenever they have a slightest feeling that they will be arrested, nobody, nobody will visit your service. So it's essential that you first, before you do your first testing, that you have arranged this relationship with police. And we have managed that in our country. Thank you. Anyone else? <laughs> okay. Um, in Colombia, it's permitted the people uh, take uh, the drugs, the minimal dose for the law. And uh, my organization and the, the, uh, uh, the um, okay, is remember. Um, and the five, five years before the relations of the police is bad, is now is very nice relation and they change this information I and the uh, approach the substance for the police, the analysis, and the, the police is very impossible and contain the more drugs. And, the, and, and, the, and my project and the police is, is in, in this moment is no problem. Um, drug checking services ex exist, particularly the more advanced technologies. They actually exist at supervised consumption spaces. And so um, those are protected. Uh, people can legally use drugs at those sites. Um, so there aren't issues with the police. Police can't go into those sites and they can't make arrests in those sites. However, uh, we have seen, not just in Vancouver and in other jurisdictions in Canada, that um, once someone leaves a drug consumption room, uh, you know, it's what they're doing on, at the street level, uh, they might get picked up or arrested or harassed by police, and that's, that does happen. Um, so, uh, secondly, when I was talking about engaging drug dealers, um, if people who are using drugs um, might not be targeted for possession by police, but those who are trafficking drugs are especially targeted by police. So the criminalization of drugs, and particularly people who are selling drugs, may be a barrier for people to accessing this service. Um, because, you know, if you're bringing your drugs to a location where it's safe, but then walking there and also leaving there, it's not safe. So there's some issues there, so. Experience from Ukraine or friends? Uh, in Ukraine, uh, we all only worked at uh, uh, seven events, so so far we did not have luckily any interaction with the police at the events itself, but, but the client do tell us about the interaction with police and there are different kinds of interactions, individual as well as kind of mass interaction. Uh, there were a couple of cases of uh, raids in the nightclubs where people were arrested and, and also violence was also uh, there, uh, but in kind of most events are tolerated. Also, police actually knows that uh, the uh, recreational drug use happening in certain uh, places, but uh, you know, it's not every day they use, they do the rights. But we talk to the police at central level. Uh, as I said, they are not completely ready to actually support uh, drug checking services, but we are working on this. And also, uh, the drug checking service is not uh, hugely publicized so far. We only publicize through social media. We don't want to put big boards uh, telling the police and, you know, telling the uh, 
concerned parents about our services necessarily. Thank you. Thank you. Laurent? Yes, um, I just wanted to give some uh, elements for the, from the French uh, situation. So, uh, in France, we had bad uh, experiences uh, with the law enforcement regarding especially uh, the region test a few years back, and it, le it left some. Uh, uh, heritage as the perspective of the law enforcement regarding drug checking. Um, now, I mentioned that the, uh, the 2016 uh, health law uh, recognized drug checking as an arm reduction mission, but still the product still is illicit and you can still uh, be at risk. So it's a bit of a hypocrisy that activists and workers are, are stuck with. Um, so what we do is to uh, inform local authorities, that's key, uh, as my colleagues also mentioned, um, to, to ensure that everything is out in the open and that we know what we do. And also there's a measure in the 2016 uh, health law that protects uh, our production uh, workers, even if they are not um, professional workers, uh, from being prosecuted, but you would still have to go to court to prove your case. So it's still a bit of a hypocritic uh, situation, but we are more protected than we were before uh, regarding uh, checking. That's why we are scaling up now. Just, just adding just a, a thing. Um, no, the law in France is uh, not clear enough about what is considered as a drug checking service, and we have to to define it more, like a quality chart, for example. And um, as Laurent said, uh, the law uh, starts to protect uh, harm reduction staffs, but don't protect at all people who use drugs, so when they, uh, they need to have access to that kind of service, they are not predicted at, at all, so we have to change it also. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, this was a question from Diana in Colombia, and she is interested in hearing from you the methodology on how you collect your data and how you use that to convince governments uh, to adopt this method. For the whole panel. Shall we start uh, at the other end? Jeff, do you maybe want to start? Okay, so... Um Mine is a bit different because, uh, so there, there have been studies uh, done on drug checking um, that are engaging people that are using the service. So those are studies that are looking at what percentage of people are using them, what are the reasons they're using them for. Um, we found a lot of quantitative studies that are um, on willingness to use, um, have really high numbers, really high percentages. Um, but then when it was actually rolled out in Vancouver, when only 1% of clients were actually using the service, there's a clear discrepancy between willingness to use and what was actual use. So um, I'm a qualitative researcher. And so we did interviews with people to kind of unpack um, what are the reasons why people may not be using these services. Um, and so qualitative research is a really useful method to really probe at these discrepancies in, in larger quantitative studies um, because you can, uh, rather than saying, would you use the services, why, and check these boxes, we can really ask, okay, you're not using this service. Um, you've mentioned that you use crystal meth every day um, and you're living in poverty. You can really start to actually understand their day-to-day -day experiences, which is something that's harder to capture in a larger quantitative study. So that's how we did our work. Maybe a couple of words in terms of data. Uh, the, uh, we 
only starting, but you know the, the data will be collected and presented to the government and the relevant authorities. Uh, for now, it's difficult because the only statistical data on drug use, for example, we have from school surveys, where there is significant bias and underestimation of the prevalence, uh, and also there is limited access to statistics on overdose or kind of health events related to the recreational drug use. But the uh, what we are building now is a powerful instrument for data collection and we are planning to use our online access to uh, people who use drugs recreationally to obtain this data. So we are starting to, to build the surveys that we will be put in place very soon. Thank you. In France we are uh, collect collecting data thanks to um, um, a protected uh, database so we can uh, uh, pro protect uh, the whole system and guarantee to users a uh, total um, anonym, anonymous uh, service, anonymity service, you know. And um, we, uh, that's uh, a strong point that, strong point that we, we, we defend, you know. It's really important to, to have a protected database for the people. And um, uh, talking about working with our government, that was the second part of your question, I guess. Um, we are trying to federate a maximum of actor, uh, um, uh, harm reduction uh, uh, facilities, maximum uh, of actors in, in France to ask the same thing uh, to our government. Uh, which is interested by um, knowing better what we are doing, describing what we are doing. So they started to uh, give, um, give us uh, uh, some uh, financial st support to describe our practices. And we ask now with them to work on an uh, impact evaluation to know better what is uh, uh, positive for people and what can be better for um, in uh, our practices. And just to complete a very short uh, uh, element, uh, the, the linkage with the uh, health monitoring center is key here because the, uh, the French monitoring center for drug and drug addiction has a whole monitoring system and they are collecting data also and so the linkage between the data that we can collect in our medical services and the data that is collected just put it in a health perspective. And this is a health, also a health and social issue. Uh, and so this is a strong argument to convince uh, the government uh, to think of the drug policy not as a criminal, uh, not from a criminal perspective, but from a health and social perspective. Does that make sense? Sorry, this is my comment. In Spanish. Um, desde el principio estamos evaluando, desde la primera vez que lo hicimos hace 10 años, cada sustancia tiene una hoja de vida juiciosa. Nos hemos inspirado en otros proyectos del mundo, Inspired for Project for You, Under Energy Control, de ot otros proyectos que cómo lo han hecho. Um, evaluamos el impacto en el cambio de comportamiento de las personas cada tres años, es un poco como ellos han apropiado y le hemos apuntado a un indicador especialmente y es la reducción de la intoxicación por drogas, el ingreso a los hospitales, eso. Pero más importante que todos estos indicadores está en que todos los días, creo que cada semana, hablamos con ellos. Entonces tenemos un diálogo directo con la policía, como qué salió nuevo, qué es lo que hay, que ya viste esta sustancia, nos intercambiamos. Lo mismo con el Ministerio de Salud. Lo mismo con el Ministerio de Justicia. Entonces, creo que no tanto los datos, sino una conversación constante con ellos. 6,100 hojas de vida, más o menos, de cada sustancia este, existe. Puedo hablar en Dutch, no, sorry. Um, I believe that you know in our country this drug checking is a win-win situation. It's a win situation for drug users because they gain knowledge about the substance they have bought and they are about to use. But for us, for scientists and also for the government, it gives a lot of additional information about what's actually going on on the market. So it's a very essential monitoring tool to monitor the market for 
existing drugs, the purity prices and so on, but also for emerging new drugs. As we have been doing this work for so many years, we have, for instance, seen the emergence of all these new designer drugs. And we always say measuring is knowing. Without measuring, you don't really know what's going on. And based on our work, we are very confident to say that, for instance, this use of designer drugs in our country is very limited. We can see it through our samples. And so the government, uh, we inform them about the results of our work. We have 12,000 samples every year. It's in an aggregated form, so it's not directed to a single person, but we give proper information about what's going on in the drug market, and uh, they are quite happy with that. Thank you. Uh, this is all the time we have. Uh, thank you to all the speakers. Uh, thank you to the press that was here. Uh, feel free to approach the speakers uh, now uh, for a one-on-one -on -one interview or additional questions. There's also a session on uh, drug checking this afternoon at 2 for those that are present at the conference. So feel free to join and uh, the presenters will give a bit more detail about uh, their work. Thank you on behalf of the conference and I wish you a nice day.